Amen. Let us pray. Eternal God, our Father, we thank you that you do choose to lead us. That you take the time, pay us the attention. God, we ask that we would, that you'd incline our hearts to follow. Lord, speak now unto your people that we might receive what you have for us today. Bless us in this moment and keep us. In Jesus' name we pray. People of God say amen. amen. I greet you in the name of our Savior, Jesus the Christ. And the word of the Lord comes to us today from the book of Isaiah, the book of the prophet Isaiah. Some call this section third Isaiah, but it is Isaiah chapter 64. Isaiah chapter 64, just one verse, verse 1. Isaiah 64, verse 1, it says, Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains would tremble before you. Oh, that you would rend the heavens, tear the heavens and come down that the mountains would tear, tremble before you. And I want to offer for you a subject today of what to do when things come unglued. Well. What to do when things come unglued. Have you ever felt like things just came unglued? Like all craziness was breaking out all around you? What to do? when things come unglued. This, this particular passage of scripture, most scholars date at around 538 B.C. The prophet and the people of God are in deep distress. The day of freedom has come to an exiled people of God. King Cyrus of Persia now dominates the world. He's opened the door of freedom for the people of Israel who have been in captivity to Babylon for many years, 70 years approximately. But King Cyrus has opened up the door of freedom to the people of Israel that now may look forward to going home and rebuilding their nation, reconstructing their temple, and reestablishing their faith and practice of worship. But although the door is open to a new beginning... It feels to the people of God like they are now worse off than they were before. Under Babylonian rule, things were bad, but at least they were predictable. At least they were consistent. Now, they have a multiplicity of multifaceted problems. Amen. From, from, folk who, uh, from folk who were afraid to leave Babylon to a dangerous journey back to their homeland that some would not survive, to a city that was in ruins that they felt uh, they, that they did not have the resources to build, amen, to a temple that had been destroyed under the hand of the Babylonians. They're facing this, 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 collection of problems that, that, that seem completely overwhelming. So even though the door was open, they now face this complicated matrix of problems that they were totally overwhelmed by. They felt like things had completely come unglued. So Isaiah pleads to God to do something and do it right away. He cries desperately to a God he knows is there. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down and do something about this thing right now. Oh, my God. That, that is a familiar cry to most of us. Right now, in this land of the free, our people are crying out for what I dare to call a quadruple pandemic. My God. COVID is still ravaging us with the added complication of the flu season. The economic pandemic still has people desperate for work and devoid of what they need to survive. The racist pandemic keeps on assaulting us 
with injustice and oppression. And here in Philadelphia, the pandemic of homicide is spreading as uncontrollably as the wildfires in California. All of this mixed with pathological leadership that we have now makes it feel like everything is coming unglued and makes us cry out, when is relief coming? We need you to rip open the sky and come down. Now those of us who are believers believe that God is coming down to straighten out what's wrong. Question is, what do we do when things come unglued until God comes down and makes things right? Let's look at three things that we should not do. Amen. The first is don't assume God is punishing us. Don't assume God is punishing us. Now, I'm not saying there's no punishment for sin and sin is rampant. It is. It comes to us in this life. Those who abuse themselves and disregard God's ways do pay a penalty for what they do. There are consequences to sin. Selfishness impoverishes the selfish. And those who steal from others steal from themselves their own self-respect and peace of mind. Sin will hurt you. Make no mistake about it. Sin will make you hurt yourself. No mistake about it. God does punish sin. God has to punish sin. Just as any wise parent must depose anything that threatens to destroy the child. But having recognized that, Having acknowledged the wrath and judgment of God that is inevitably visited upon the wicked. Don't assume that every bad thing that happens, happens to wicked people only. Jesus was a perfect man. In him dwelt the fullness of God bodily, but that did not keep him from having to suffer. Things went wrong in the life of the light of the world. He was hated without cause, rejected without reason, arrested for doing good, convicted for being innocent, crucified for being light, buried for being truth and love, sealed in the grave, guarded uh, in his death for being savior from sin, death, hell, and the grave. Yes, it happened to Jesus. Sometimes things come unglued, however, to mobilize those things that God wants to use to set things right. Sometimes, unfortunately, it takes all craziness to break loose for, for things to begin to be mobilized in the right direction. Sometimes, unfortunately, it takes enough young people getting killed in our neighborhoods to get people stirred up enough to do something about illegal guns and find something to keep our kids occupied during the summer. Sometimes when things go wrong, they're lined up to be made right. Not just a punishment, but a, but a time of, of, of uh, when, when things are being set in the right direction. Second, when things come unglued, don't look for somebody to blame. What do you mean by that? Doesn't somebody need to be punished for these situations that we find ourselves in? Shouldn't we blame the politicians? Shouldn't we blame the greedy folks? Shouldn't we blame the gangsters that work in our streets? Shouldn't we get it? blame the gun run runners and drug tycoons and predators? The man, should we blame? You could. But you'd be missing an essential element of the real problem. The problems are bigger than the perceived enemies. You could lose every enemy you think you have and still face hell the next day. Paul recognized that the problem is never limited to a specific person, no matter how many Hitlers Bin Ladens, or even White House squatters. Come along. It's even bigger than that. The problem is systemic. 
It's gotten into the system. There is a system, economic, political, social problem that favors some and deprives others. That's why Paul was able to say we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Amen. I was listening to a sermon or a message by Reverend Al Sharpton, and he was saying to show that it is a spiritual reality, we need to understand that the same spirit that made people think it's okay to enslave other people is the same spirit that empowers people who are hired by the taxpayers to think that they can just inadvertently murder some folk in the community. Wow. It's the same spirit. Amen. There's a systemic problem. It's more than, there's more to racism than how an individual feels about another person. There's more to violence than, than one individual's senseless act. There's more, there is a systemic problem, a culture of violence that fosters and rewards aggressive behavior. There's more to sexism and misogyny and, and sexual assault than just one person's hatred or lust. There's a culture of patriarchy and objectifying women that fosters and rewards the player or the pimp character that keeps those things in place. Once we understand that, we can fight violence without becoming violent and wanting to do violence against the violent. We could fight racism without hating people of other cultures. We can fight crime and mass incarceration by focusing on correction rather than just judgment. We can hate sin without hating the sinner. Amen. When you, when things come unglued, don't become bitter. That'll do more to destroy you than to hurt anybody you hate. Hatred, bitterness, and unforgiveness will only po poison your own thought processes, freeze your initiative, hinder your ingenuity, stifle your own creativity, and make it impossible for you to cope with the system that's really the problem. Don't spend your time looking for someone to blame. Third, when things come unglued, don't give up. Those who give up are making an idol out of this present negative set of circumstances and bowing down before it, giving in and giving up as if negative forces are in charge of this world. Those who give up allow themselves to be caught up in the crunch of what's happening now. They don't remember the wonderful things that God did in the past. They don't anticipate the great things that God has promised to do in the future. They believe the only thing that matters is the pain and problem and perplexity that we have right now. So they give in and surrender without a struggle. If they don't find a job right away, they quit looking. They'll generalize, amen, and, and, uh, and, and idolize the denials and say, no need of looking anymore. But if you're looking for a job, don't be worn out by the long series of denials. Just keep on looking until God opens the right door for you to find the right job. That closed door might have saved your life, might have saved your situation, because God was getting you set up for the right situation. Amen. Don't assume God is punishing us. Don't look for somebody to blame. Don't give up. What do you do? What do you do when things come unglued? First, remember who you are. Remember who you are. You ought to know that you are a child of God. Things have come unglued, but you are a child of God. God is your holy parent. You are not a mistake. You are not an accident. God has put purpose in your life. You are not helpless. God has not given you weakness and helplessness and futility and fatality and fear and frustration, but God has given you power and love and a sound mind. There is something you can do with your situation because God 
is your source and your strength. New visions are unfolding before your eyes. Divine blood is coursing through your spiritual veins. Creative impulses are tingling in your fingers. Transformative thoughts are breaking like day in your head. God is your strength. You are somebody. You can do something. You are not bound or limited by your situation. If sickness stops up your ears, like Beethoven, who lost his hearing at 26 years old. You can still hear the heavenly symphony and write it down on a piece of paper. Amen. If they take away your hearing and your speech, like Helen Keller, who was deaf and blind, you can find a way to communicate through touch. If they take away your arms and your hands, you can still use your mouth to sing songs and record them. Wow. Amen. You are somebody. If they take you captive, the Holy Ghost can break the chains of your heart like they did, like he did Richard Allen, so that even while you're living on a plantation physically, you can declare that my dungeon shook and my chains fell off. You are somebody. You are made in the image of of the Most High. You are fashioned according to God's likeness. You are filled with God's precious spirit. You are a child of God. When it unglued, when it comes unglued, remember who you are. Second, when things come unglued, take authority. You are a child of God, so you don't have to be victim of tragedy, but you can be victor over tragedy. Don't take care, take authority. Be a thermostat and not a thermometer. Henry Crane said that there are those who trust God and know God are not thermometers because a thermometer is passive and just measures and reflects what's around it. It only expresses conditions, outside conditions. It goes up when the temperature goes up and it goes down when the temperature goes down. It's not proactive, but it's reactive. Many people are like that. They don't fix anything or change anything. They don't make anything better. They just react. They register. They reflect. They repeat. They report on what's going on. But that's not a child of God. If you know God for yourself, you are not a passive thermometer, but you are an active thermostat. And the thermostat does not just register the temperature. A thermostat will change. The temperature. If it's too cold, the thermostat will shut off the air conditioner. Amen. If it starts getting too hot, the thermostat will engage that condenser unit and blow some cool air into the room. Don't just reflect the atmosphere. You've got the Holy Ghost. You ought to set the atmosphere. Take authority. That's right. Take thou authority. Third, when things come unglued, Take something. Take prisoners. Take prisoners. Make sure you get some learning out of it. Paul sounds a serious warning. And he says in 2 Corinthians 6, 1, As God's fellow workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. It's a tragedy to go through a pandemic. But it's worse tragedy if you go through it without getting something out of it. It's a terrible thing to go through suffering, go through major surgery, go through first class grief, to pay the price of pain in full, and then walk away from the encounter the same way you entered it. Amen. A young preacher was pouring out his heart and his soul to one of the greatest preachers of them all, Dr. Gardner C. Taylor. And after listening to his tragic story, Dr. Taylor said, Preacher, Make sure that you don't go through all that hurting for nothing. As a result of your trouble, you ought to make some gain. Your prayer life ought to be deeper. Your faith ought to be stronger. Your hope ought to be more polished. Your worship ought to taste sweeter as a result of having gone through problems. Show me a person who's never suffered, and I'll show you a person that has no power. You'll get power out of the suffering. I don't want it, and you don't want it. I sure enough don't want it. 
But, but that's where the power is. Amen. That's where the power is. There are certain songs that you're not going to be able to sing with any kind of anointing until you've gone through something. Amen. I, I, I don't, amen. Amen. There's certain job that you can't do until after you've been through something. Because there's power in the blood. Blood is not a garnishment. Blood is more than a song lyric. Blood is symbolic of suffering. And there's power in the blood. Power in going through. You ought to get something out of it. David said it's good for me that I have been afflicted. It wasn't good to me. <laughs> but it was good for me. Amen. <laughs> I, that I've been afflicted. Make sure you get something out of this quadruple pandemic. Make sure that you learn something so that on the other side you can say I've been through it. I stood through it. God kept me through it. Last thing. When things come unglued, make sure you stick around long enough to get the joy at the end of it. Don't abort the process. Amen. As, as strange as it may seem, those who suffer in faith say, can say like Paul, we rejoice in our tribulations. We shout through our trials. Black slaves suffering under the iron heat of slavery felt the pain of torture and tragedy and said, nobody knows the trouble I see. But then at the end they said, glory, hallelujah. There's a joy at the end of it. Why the joy? This is not the morbid joy of a masochist who, who takes pleasure in their own pain. But this is a joy that only God can give. A joy that sees the rainbow of hope hanging on the clouds of trouble. Joy not because life is good, but because life is life and God is good. Joy because the cross I bear is not greater than the grace that God has given me to bear it. The clouds cannot hide his blessed face. Joy because trouble cannot defeat you. Death cannot destroy you. The grave cannot hold your body down. Joy because your enemies cannot beat you. Joy because God is for you and who can be against you. Joy because truth crushed to the earth will rise again. Joy because the kingdom will come. Joy because God's will will be done. Joy because every knee shall bow and every tongue must confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Joy because weeping may endure for a night but I can see the morning coming. Joy because one of these days the wicked will cease from troubling and the weary shall be at rest. Joy because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Joy because nothing can separate you from the love of your God. Joy, a joy that the world did not give you and that the world cannot take away. A joy that will make your behind come up unglued from that seat that you're on. A joy that will make your hands come unglued from your side. A joy that will make your tongue come unglued from the roof of your mouth. Somebody ought to that thing. Somebody might think you've come unglued, but if anybody asks you, what's the matter with me? Tell them I'm saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, baptized, fire baptized. I'm unglued with the praise of my God. I'm unglued with the praise of my King. I'm unglued because nothing can hold me back. I'm unglued because nobody can keep me out. I'm unglued because God has put a joy in my spirit. I'm unglued because God has put a running in my feet. I'm unglued because God has put a wave in my hands. I'm unglued because God has put a praise in my mouth. Somebody ought to come unglued right now because God has you in. God's hands. Is there anybody watching who's ready to come unglued and know that God has 
hands you in the palm of God's hand to what to do. When things come unglued. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You are a child of God. You are a child of the living God. God is able to keep you when all craziness breaking out all around you. Hallelujah. My pastor used to say, when you can keep your head and everybody around you is losing theirs, you're anchored in something that's powerful, stronger than the winds that are blowing around you. Amen. And you might cry some tears. Holly, you might have some sleepless nights, but God's got you in the palm of God's hands. I just want to let somebody know today, God's got you. You just have to let the Lord have God's way. And let God mold you and shape you into the person God wants you to be. Hallelujah. It's all part of the process. Don't feel good all the time. We struggle with it. Hallelujah. But understand that God is not surprised by it. That it's part of what God wants to do in your life. And you're going to come out better on the other side. So I just need somebody to throw your hands up and say, Have your own way, Lord. You the pot. I'm the clay. Mold me and shape me after thy will. While I am waiting, yielding. And still is there anybody today who's willing to let the Lord 